Let's go back to one very crucial moment, and that's basically the Paris Accord is one of the biggest uh, successes uh, of Obama. And you said that you've been working with the Chinese for a long time, and they had a certain position on uh, what they think that climate, who caused climate change and who should fix it. But at a certain point, we had Obama and the president of China declaring that uh, this, this was important and needed to be done. Can you tell us behind the scenes how, how, that, how that process worked? Yeah, there was a very long process leading up to that, uh, a, a process that was uh, literally decades long in which uh, Chinese scientists and Chinese officials met with American scientists and officials in private, uh, both in China and in the United States, discussing these matters. And when we started these kinds of discussions, which was really uh, in the early 1990s, the Chinese position was that global climate change is real, but it's a, it's a problem that was caused mainly by the industrialized nations. That most of the stuff in the atmosphere that was causing this problem was put there by the industrialized nations in the process of their getting rich, and it was completely inappropriate for them to tell the developing countries, now there's no room left in the atmosphere for your emissions, so you have to stop. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like a reasonable uh, point of view. It, well, it is a, a, a reasonable point of view from the historical standpoint. And my response to that was to say to the Chinese, you're exactly right. The industrialized countries did cause most of it. The industrialized countries do have an obligation to lead in the solution. But you are going to need to join because your emissions are rising rapidly. And if you don't join, if China doesn't join, if India doesn't join in the effort to reduce these emissions, ultimately that effort will fail and we will all suffer. Mm -hmm. And that argument became steadily more powerful with the Chinese as the impacts of climate change in China began to be felt. And by the early 2000s, the community of Chinese climate scientists had concluded that global climate change was affecting the West Asian monsoon in a manner that was having adverse impacts on agriculture in China in a very significant way. The other thing that, of course, they very quickly figured out is they had a big problem with conventional pollution, with fine particles in the atmosphere from burning smoke and biofuels, with sulfur oxides, with nitrogen oxides. Every five days, they had a new uh, coal plant uh, coming, well, uh, coming and online. And they figured out, of course, because it was obvious, that what they needed to do to reduce this conventional pollution and the damage it was doing to health in China was also going to help with the climate change problem. And so they became steadily more positive about China playing a significant role. They continued in the public rhetoric of the decision makers. They continued to use this line that it's mainly the fault of the industrialized countries and the industrialized countries are going to have to lead. But privately, we were having extensive conversations, including calculations of when it would be possible for China to peak their emissions, to reduce their coal consumption. And the date that they were willing to talk about kept getting closer. That is, in the late 1990s, they were saying, well, maybe 2050. Uh, by the early 2000s, they were saying maybe 2040. Uh, by 2010, they were saying uh, maybe 2035. And uh, all privately, yeah. all privately. Mm -hmm. But when finally, in November 2014, President Obama and President Xi stood up in Beijing and announced both countries' goals for reducing emissions and saying, we're the two biggest economies, we're the two biggest emitters, we recognize this is an enormous global challenge, and we are prepared, both of us, to lead. That came out of dozens and dozens of meetings uh, over the years and more intensively leading up to that particular event. Uh, and so it was a very, it was a very long and very uh, arduous process. Yeah. But... Uh, it must have been a great moment. To, to when you were, were, were you there? Were you there? I did not go there. I did go to Paris, but I didn't go with the president. You did Beijing. not go to Paris? I How is that possible? I did go to Paris. I didn't go to Beijing. Oh, you didn't I did go to Paris, but I didn't go to Beijing. Oh. Um, but... Um, one of my deputies, who is an expert on energy and climate policy in China and speaks Mandarin, had taken a sabbatical leave from her university position to work with us in the White House. She worked 
uh, for me and for John Podesta in the White House, and she worked for Todd Stern, our chief climate negotiator in the State Department, and she went. Kelly Gallagher, Professor Kelly Gallagher, who is at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, full professor, the head of their Global Environment uh, Research Center. Uh, she was once my student, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and she was instrumental behind the scenes in this process. Uh, her name is not a household word, but among people who understand the history of climate negotiations with China, she is a household word. <laughs> How was Paris for you? Well, Paris was also very exciting, obviously. Uh, and the president was there for the first part of the Paris meeting. But what happened, again, that not everybody knows is that after the president left Paris and the negotiations were still going on, he was on the telephone every day to heads of state who we needed to keep on the team. Like who? And particularly uh, Prime Minister Modi of India. Uh, there was great worry that India was going to jump off the train and this would be terrible uh, because India was on the, on the way to becoming the third biggest emitter. They now are the third biggest emitter behind China and the United States. And uh, the president was on the phone with Modi every day, keeping him on board. Uh, and that was actually instrumental. Again, if President Obama had not had this extraordinary commitment to getting the job done on climate change, Paris Accord would never have happened. Uh, would never have happened. Is it real? Do you think it's real if you see the actions now around the world? Oh, I think it's real. It, uh, everybody knew at the time it, it's not enough. It's a first step. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people have criticized Paris by saying, well, it won't solve the problem. Well, no single set of steps and nothing one can do between now and 2025 or 2030 will solve the problem in any final way. But we have to get on the right path. I can say in the, in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, we are serious. Yeah. We are serious. And, how, and I wonder, I wonder from where you're where you're looking, how are other big countries? How how serious are they? China is very serious. Yeah. Uh, many of the other European countries are very serious. Yeah. Uh, Mexico is serious. Brazil is serious. Uh, Indonesia is serious. Uh, Japan is serious. Korea, South Korea is serious. India has been, I would say, a few years behind China in their recognition uh, of the dangers that climate change was posing to India, but they're now on top of it. And they have uh, a, a climate advisory council to the prime minister that is constantly informing the prime minister and his other senior advisors of the latest climate science. They know climate change is already damaging to India. In the hottest parts of India, it is already impossible to work outside in the hottest months of the year. We, by the way, have to finish soon because I, I would say, say you know, you, yeah, you needed to get to the boat. Yeah, that was yeah, my last thing. To to it's too bad because it's really very interesting to talk. Uh, let me let me finish about what happened when you left. I mean, how does that feel to see Trump going as a bully through the, uh, the, through the porcelain shop? <laughs> The bull in the china shop. Yeah, no, that's been very painful. Uh, it's been painful for all of us who were engaged in trying to build up these uh, initiatives, these advances in energy, in climate change, in uh, <coughs> health care, uh, in immigration policy. Yeah. Uh, I was even involved in immigration policy because high skills immigration is very important to the innovative capacity of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, to see all of this unraveled as rapidly as Trump and his deputies have been doing it is very demoralizing. Uh, and it's even more demoralizing for the president because of course not just the things that I was involved in but all of the things he did. If he did it, Trump wants to dismantle it. Uh, and why, why is that? Where does that come from, that, that in <laughs> incredible hate in what he has accomplished? I, I think, number one, that Trump is a racist uh, and was deeply unhappy that we had uh, an African-American president. Uh, Trump, after all, was uh, a major figure in what's called the birther movement, the people who were asserting that Obama wasn't even born in the United States and therefore was not entitled mm -hmm. to be president. Yeah. Uh, I think... Uh, Trump also uh, is uh, unhappy about how much Obama accomplished as, as an African-American president. You know, m people who worked with Obama never particularly thought of him as African-American. We thought of him as a brilliant 
leader. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate that th that that sort of approach of just recognizing immense human talent in this individual and immense passion and commitment to making the world a better place, uh, you know, that's what's unique about the man, not the color of his skin. Uh, but in any case, uh, there are people out there, and I include Trump among them, who never accepted that we could have an African-American as a president of the United States. So that's on and the part basis of the analysis. Part of, part of their response to that is to try to dismantle it. Now, other things that he did, some of the things that he did were things Republicans tend not to like. They don't like regulation. And because we couldn't get the Congress to help with a carbon tax or cap and trade, some of our approaches to dealing with climate change involve regulation. The approaches we took to dealing with other kinds of pollution involve regulation. And Republicans as a party tend to oppose that. But I need to tell you, there is a tremendous pushback in the wider society against what Trump is trying to do. With respect to climate change, we have what's called the America's Pledge, which has a, a thousand corporations, uh, a thousand major American corporations. It has hundreds of cities. It has uh, more than 20 states of the United States, many civil society organizations, hundreds of universities saying, Trump may be withdrawing from Paris, but we're still in. Lots of action being taken in the United States by entities other than the federal government to address the climate change challenge. And that's encouraging. On that note, go get the boat. Thank you very much for your time, thank John. You. And thank you for the presentation.